In this video, I'm going to compare the Shopsmith Mark 5 Model 510 to the new Shopsmith Mark 7. I know this is an ambitious video. I'm comparing every single feature between two Shopsmiths manufactured 31 years apart. It's a lot to cover, but I think if you stick with me, you'll find it interesting. And for you Shopsmith gurus, please double check me. If I've missed anything, add it to the comments so that other people can see it. Even though the Mark 7 is brand new and the Shopsmith Mark 5 is 30 plus years old, there are still quite a few similarities between the two, although some significant differences as well. Let's start the comparison with the table system. Both systems come with a main table. They're both the same size. An extension table, again, both the same size and two auxiliary tables, again, of equal size. On both the main tables, they're supported by two posts, which go up and down based on turning a crank. The auxiliary table is supported with two posts, which slide up and down manually and tighten down with a lock below. The floating table I have on the ends on both of these units are supported by a combination of two connector tubes and two legs. Both units came with a total of four connector tubes. Both units came with their own rip fence, but I'm going to go into more detail on the rip fences later. Okay, now let's talk about some of the differences. The Mark V Model 510 uses a steel tube as its table rails, and they're the same on the front and the back of the machine. The Mark VII uses a rectangular aluminum extrusion as table rails, and they are slightly different on the front as compared to the back. The miter fence on the Shopsmith Mark 7 squares itself to the table by latching into this V-groove. The table components are connected by these connector tubes and they're locked down and registered to the fence components with these knobs from underneath. The connector tubes get seated into this valley which creates good alignment across the top and front to back. The connector tubes on the back rail mount in a similar way with the knobs beneath and the back of the rim fence registers against this angled piece of aluminum. Makes for a very solid connection. On the Mark V 510 table system, the tables connect also by the tubes but are tightened down with these knurled knobs. When I tighten this down, I'm putting pressure this way on this inner pipe which forces it out to this inner wall. That does do a decent job of aligning it vertically and horizontally, but it's not as fail-proof as the Mark 7 table rail system. Also, these nuts tend to get jammed and can be difficult to loosen by hand. That's why I've taken to carrying this old set of channel locks in my apron. The 510 rip fence is sort of a wraparound system with a hook that latches on under the pipes. So you sort of wrap it around and then tighten it down. On the back side, this little lever hooks around the pipe with a rubber grip. It's pretty solid, but not as solid as the Shopsmith Mark 7 fence system. One minor difference in the Shopsmith Mark 7 resulting from the global pandemic supply chain is this rail connector that connects the connecting tubes for the table system to the support legs. They're not as nice as the rail connectors that came with my Shopsmith Mark V, but they do work. Uh, one minor note here is I use this quarter inch hex key to tighten them down. It's a little loose, so it's most likely a metric size hex key that's required for that. And here's the version that came with my Shopsmith Mark V, model 510, and it uses the standard 532nd hex key which is very convenient. A very nice added feature of the Shopsmith Mark 7 table rail system is this magnetic strip here, which holds this magnetic stainless steel ruler. This is a really nice laser etched ruler. I'm very impressed with it. Uh, the way you set this up is you move your fence over so it just touches the blade. You lock it down and then you zero out the ruler onto the black guide there. Now, when I move the fence over to make a two inch cut, I just line it up with the two inch mark. I've only used this a couple of times, 
but I have found it to be very accurate. This is a metric steel ruler. Originally it was an adhesive back system and I just scraped off all the adhesive. It's not as nice as the Shopsmith ruler, but I do like to work in metric whenever I can. Now I have the option to set up my fence in metric units. On the Shopsmith Mark 7, it is a little more difficult to access the push button for the 90 degree stop and see the scale and reach the lock because this rail is definitely taller. You can see on the 510 you have a little more open access and I don't have to bend down as much. But the tables tilt in the same manner. I would loosen this lock here and then tilt the table. Same thing here. From this angle, you can see that the casting is slightly different for the main table between the Shopsmith 510 on the right and the Mark 7 on the left. But functionally, they're more or less identical. For some reason, the Mark 7 has these bumps here on all four corners where this table does not. I will say that there's some advantage uh, to not having those and just having a smooth straight surface here on the edge. But then again, I don't know if there's any purpose to this, so um, I, I can't really say. But the trunnion system and crossbar, including the dust cover here, um, all seem to be pretty much identical. And here on the Shopsmith Mark 7, you can see that the grooves on this side of the table tube, which mesh with the gear down here, that's operated by the crank are on this side and on this side. That means the table can flip around this way to support under table routing. On the Shopsmith 510 there's grooves on one side but it is entirely smooth on the other. So the 510 table cannot flip around as is. Okay let's take a look at the headstocks. The headstocks are very similar in fact, they're almost identical except for one important detail, which is the type of motor that each of these headstocks have inside along with the control panel. This on the Mark 7 is obviously a computerized digital control panel and this dial on the Shopsmith Mark 5 Model 510 is obviously a mechanical crank. The Shopsmith Mark 5 Model 510 there in the back was I believe manufactured in the first year of the C type headstock. So that's the headstock that has the red safety switch here. Obviously the Mark 7 has the red safety switch and on the Mark 5 there's the V here which is a pointer to indicate uh, which letter you're at on the speed dial. That V is still here on the Shopsmith Mark 7 although it's completely unnecessary because there's no dial to turn. I guess you can consider that a vestigial organ of sorts. The quill lever is very similar. Really the only difference I can see is one is black and one is red. The way to block and the quill lock and the depth adjustment are more or less identical on both machines. This spindle cover is another standard feature of the Shopsmith Mark 7 that does not come with the Shopsmith Mark 5 Model 510. I've decided not to add it because I really rely on turning this top spindle by hand. For one, to put the flat of the opposite side of the spindle in easy reach. And for two, whenever I do a setup, I like to give it a spin by hand to make sure nothing's running before I go ahead and power it on. In a previous video, I spoke about two innovations that really was a game changer for the Shopsmith system. That is the ability to move the motor back and forth to the tool or workpiece and the ability to extend the quill. The Shopsmith Mark 7 preserves that innovation. The headstock moves back and forth and the quill extends. Although I will say this headstock moves a lot easier than this one. And when I get these two machines side by side, I really see the wear and tear on this 31 year old machine. Another place you can see that wear and tear is on the bench tubes and way tubes. You just get a close up there of the Shopsmith Mark 7 tubes 
compared to the 510 tubes. It's just really nice having those fresh, clean bench tubes and weigh tubes to work with. Okay, let's talk about the base of these two units. I'm talking about the legs, the tailstocks, the weigh tubes, and the bench tubes. Another key feature of the ShopSmith multi-purpose tool is the ability to tilt the unit upward in the vertical position to use as a vertical drill press or even an overhead router. With the Mark 7, I can tilt in the same direction. The locking is a little different. I unscrew this knob, make sure everything's locked down, and I lift it up. However, the ShopSmith Mark 7 has the double tilt feature, which means that I have tilting tail stocks on both ends. So I can unscrew and unlock this side, and I can now tilt the machine in this direction. And this would be for under table routing and shaping. I could also put a drum sander on there and do drum sanding from underneath the table. But other than those differences, the base units are identical in length, width, and height, and most of the functionality. I can mount special purpose tools here on both ends, on both machines. I can move the system over, and I have plenty of room to mount my ShopSmith Mark mounted thickness planer on both machines. On either machine, I should say. Let's take a look at the tilting tail stocks on the right hand side of both machines. You can see that the castings are very similar and the operation is very similar. A key difference that the Mark 7 has is this release knob screw allows me to release this so this can pull away. You'll notice that there's a gap there that allows it to straddle that bar. And then I lock it back down. The ShopSmith Mark V does not have that screw and it's a continuous hole through this casting. There's no gap so this top piece cannot lift off the base for tilting anyway. There are also set screws on top here which is very convenient when you need to work on the weigh tubes. Uh, the set screws in this casting are accessed from below. On the left hand side of the machine things are very different. This is the two piece tail stock. Release the lever here which allows this to separate so that the unit can tilt up. On the ShopSmith Mark 7 the left hand tail stock is more or less identical to the right hand tail stock. Again it supports unlocking here so that the machine can lift up from this end and tilt in that direction. I know it's been a long video already and I thank everyone who stuck with me. But now I need to move on to the standard accessories. ShopSmith Mark 7 came with a big list of standard accessories. In my opinion it's a great value and I'm going to go through every single one and compare them with the standard accessories that came with the ShopSmith Mark 5 Model 510. As I go through the comparison of the ShopSmith Mark 5 to Mark 7 standard accessories, I want to mention that I don't actually know which accessories came standard on my ShopSmith Mark V 510, originally built in 1991, because I bought the system new. So I'm going to make some best guesses based on documentation I found and what came with my machine. Not much to say on the lower saw guard. They are more or less identical. Maybe some slight color changes here and there, for example, on the knob. But other than that, there's really no difference other than this one is newer and in much better condition. Pretty much the same story on the upper saw guard. Not much to say here. I do see some small difference with the bevel cut here in the slot. I suppose that would make it easier to seat the riving knife into the clamp. This is the 50 tooth combination blade that came with my Mark V. I assume it's original to the machine and over 30 years old. I've cleaned it so often that the nameplate is now gone, but even after 31 years, it's working great. This is the blade that came with my ShopSmith Mark 7. It's labeled as a 50 tooth carbide combination. Although I would call this tooth pattern general purpose, and I would call this tooth pattern a combination tooth pattern. And you could see the difference. Every five teeth, there's a larger gullet for clearing sawdust when making deep rips. Although this blade is thin kerf and this blade is 
full kerf. This blade has a really nice thick plate. I've seen some thin kerf blades with really thin plates and no matter how many laser cut anti-vibration patterns they put in there, uh, the blade just doesn't run true. There are anti-overfeed humps here on the back of each tooth. That's supposed to help with kickback in that you're not overfeeding the workpiece. This blade doesn't have any sort of those overfeed humps. While we're on the topic of saw blades, both machines came with an inch and a quarter saw blade arbor. That's standard for Shopsmith. There's a minor difference here on the old one. It has a hole on the back side. This one does not. Uh, other than that, they seem to be identical and they have worked identically. Going along with the saw blade arbor is the arbor wrench. This is the one that came with my Shopsmith Mark V. This is the one that came with my Shopsmith Mark VII. As far as I can tell, they're more or less identical. This is the rip fence that came with my Shopsmith Mark V Model 510. And this is the rip fence that came with my Shopsmith Mark VII, which has the 520 table system. You can see the Mark VII fence is quite a bit wider and has two T-slots on top compared to the one. It also has T-slots on both sides rather than just screw holes for attaching fixtures. Personally, I think the 510 rip fence squares up just fine when on the main table, as long as you have it tuned up. On the extension tables, it squares up, let's say 90% of the time. And that has to do with how those round tubes align. But I will give a slight advantage to the Mark 7 rip fence, not necessarily because of the rip fence itself, but because of the table system and how well the auxiliary tables align with the main table including the magnetic strip and some of those other features. These are the miter gauges with safety grip that came with the Shopsmith Mark V and the Shopsmith Mark VII. They seem to be identical, a slight color difference on the knob. Other than that, I really can't detect any differences other than that this one's really well worn out. It's got some breakage here and some saw cuts here. But this miter gauge, especially when set with the miter set, is dead on accurate and a joy to use. And so far, this one has also been the same. But I do like the fact that this one is new and crisp and doesn't have any of the damage that this one has accumulated over the years. This 12 inch sanding disc came with my Mark V. This one came with the Mark VII. They appear to be identical in every way except for the label. And this is the abrasive disc that came with the Shopsmith Mark VII. They call this a medium, which is an 80 grit disc. It looks like pretty good quality sandpaper. And here are the lathe accessories. These came with the Shopsmith Mark V, these with the Mark VII. Uh, when I bought the machine, it didn't have a post. So I ended up buying two different versions, unaware which one was the best. Uh, it turns out that this one by far is the best. Uh, this one just may be older. Uh, it may be much older than my machine, I don't know. Also used, my machine was missing the drive spur, which I purchased off of eBay some time ago. The drive spurs are identical. The cup centers, which are both dead centers, are identical. But uh, we do have some differences on every other piece. The castings seem to be the same for the body and the tool rest. But the Mark 7 comes with these nice lever adapters which quickly let you loosen and retighten to adjust your tool rests on the fly without needing to pull out your 532nd Allen key to uh, loosen the nuts here and here. So that's a really nice convenience. Another difference on the post is that there are flat spots ground on either side of the tooth row there. My understanding is that is supposed to make the post grip tighter in the hold and not slip around on you. This one doesn't have that feature. The tail stocks look very similar. Uh, some minor differences in the casting. Both of these tail stocks have a set screw adjustment on the front side of the machine, but only the Mark 7 has the set screw adjustment on the back side of the machine. So that gives some flexibility in aligning the position of your cup centers. My Shopsmith Mark V came with an Allen wrench that looks like this. This is the 532nd wrench. The Shopsmith Mark VII came with a set of Allen wrenches that are short and various sizes needed to adjust and use the machine, plus a red-handled 532nd Allen wrench. I don't know if the Mark V originally came with such Allen wrenches, but I just used these aftermarket ones instead. In the last clip, I mistakenly showed you this short 7-inch 532nd hex key. My Shopsmith Mark VII actually came with this 10-inch 532nd 
hex key. It's quite a bit longer, which is very useful. Just wanted to clear that up. This is my Shopsmith Mark V drill chuck. This is the Mark VII drill chuck. They seem to be identical in every way other than the fact that this one is older and shows a little wear. This is my Shopsmith Mark V coupling kit. This is the Shopsmith Mark VII coupling kit for special purpose tools and accessories. You can see that there's some obvious difference in materials, but functionally they seem to be identical. These are the safety goggles that came with my Shopsmith Mark VII. I did not receive safety goggles with my old Shopsmith Mark V. They were long gone by the time I bought it used seven years ago. But based on pictures I've seen, the Shopsmith Mark V did come with similar safety goggles that were the vented wraparound with the elastic strap. Like I said, they were long gone by the time I got my Mark V. Um, I wouldn't have worn them anyway. I think these uh, don't work well for me. As a glasses wearer, I don't often wear safety goggles. When I do feel I need extra protection, I use uh, something like this. Okay, let's talk safety kits. Featherboard, push block, finch straddler push block, and push stick. Notice that the push stick for my Shopsmith Mark V Model 510 is missing. I did not receive it. And that's sort of a theme that you're recognizing is that when you buy new, you get all the parts. And when you buy used, you're missing things. I did find this push stick at Menards. I believe it's a ShopFox brand. It is very similar to the Shopsmith, but a little shorter and a little smaller. I had been using this one for years, but I didn't know what I was missing. I much prefer this Shopsmith push stick. I believe the gray one would have been the same size and shape. Although I have to say, this is not a bad push stick. Uh, it's a lot better than nothing. The other question I don't know about is when did the Shopsmith five-piece safety kit become this four-piece safety kit? I know at some point in the gray tools, they did sell the five-piece safety kit, which included two push blocks. But by the time they were selling the red system, even for the Shopsmith 510, they had gone down to one push block. In my opinion, it's handy to have the extra push block. Uh, you have two hands and you can do hand over hand method using these, which is very convenient. These gray ones are branded with Shopsmith. The red ones are branded with Edgewood. Other than that, they seem to be identical, except for the fact that the Shopsmith Mark 7 fence straddler has to be a little wider to accommodate the little wider fence. I will say it's really nice to have a brand new set that's not all chewed up or beat up. Um, I did go through a process in a video a few months ago of cleaning up these push blocks and putting new pads on the bottom, which are nothing more than drawer liner. They are very sticky, and if I push hard enough, I can get it to stick to this really slick plastic, but this new pad that's on this Shopsmith Mark 7 push block, no effort, it is full on grip. So this stuff is really awesome, although these pads are pretty good. My used Shopsmith Mark V Model 510 did not come with any documentation whatsoever. I bought this Power Tool Woodworking for Everyone copy, I believe from Amazon, and I believe it's representative of the version that would have come with my 1991 machine. My new Shopsmith Mark 7 comes with both the owner's manual and a fresh copy of Power Tool Woodworking for Everyone, although the contents of these two books are identical even though this one was produced in 1989 and this one was produced in 2022. I will add that having access to Power Tool Woodworking for Everyone has increased my enjoyment of these machines immensely. Here are the under table routing and shaping accessories that came standard with the Shopsmith Mark 7. And here are the under table routing and shaping accessories that came standard with the Shopsmith Mark 5 510, which is nothing. If you've been paying attention, we've covered special accessories to support a table saw, horizontal drilling, vertical drill press, disc sander, and lathe. There's your five functions in the Shopsmith Mark V. The Shopsmith Mark VII has two additional functions. One is under table routing and shaping, and the seventh one is overhead routing and shaping. But as optional accessories on the Shopsmith Mark V 510, you could buy the same kit. So now that's a sixth function for the Shopsmith Mark V, but it just didn't come standard with the machine, so they couldn't call it a Mark VI. One caveat to this is in order to do under table routing or shaping, you would need this speed increaser attachment. 
on the Shopsmith Mark 7, it's un unnecessary for two reasons. One is the Shopsmith Mark 7 comes with the double tilt system, which allows you to tilt the machine in the vertical position in the other direction, putting the headstock underneath the table, allowing to have the router bit or shaper cutter come up from the bottom of the table. The round insert seems to be identical. The half inch router arbors seem to be identical and the half inch shaper arbors seem to be identical as well. There is a difference in the shield. This shield mounts in the T-slot on the table, while this shield mounts with the C-clamp to the edge of the table. Another difference is this shield for the Mark 7 is full length, and this shield for the speed increaser is half length. The reason that the shield is half length on the old Mark 5 system is to accommodate the shaper fence, which was another optional accessory. That's also why you mount it with the C-clamp to this table, because this fence more or less covers up most of that T-slot. And continuing on with the seventh function of the Mark 7 is the over table routing and shaping. I've brought back the table insert with the round hole, the half inch router arbor, the half inch shaper arbor, and Newly added is this dust collection chute, which attaches to the bottom here like this with these screws and the guard, which attaches to the Shopsmith quill. Notice that it's a half shield to accommodate the use of your rip fence. Now I want to talk about the optional accessories that was necessary in order to turn my Shopsmith Mark V Model 510 into an over table router or shaper. And the only accessory necessary to turn it into an over table router is a half inch router arbor or a half inch shaper arbor. It's also convenient to have a quarter inch router arbor. But there's some other things that are helpful. The overhead guard, which seems to be identical to the Mark 7 guard, came as an optional accessory. Or alternatively, you could get this quill mounted feather guard to hold down the work pieces as it passed under your router bit or shaper bit. You can't use these both at the same time because they both mount to the quill. It's also handy to have the router shaper insert with the dust collection attachment. I believe this one is actually the drum sander attachment. You can see the difference in the hole. This hole is a little bigger and on center, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the great thing about this is you could connect dust collection from below and as long as your workpiece isn't fully covering this hole it does a great job of sucking all those dust and chips right down the hole with overhead routing and shaping. And I'll bring back in the optional router shaper fence which is optional on both systems. I can of course use my standard rip fence with um, an auxiliary wood fence attached to it but what this allows me to do is to push one fence forward of the other. So if the cut I'm doing is removing a full part of the edge, then I would need to set this fence a little forward so that the board remains straight as it passed through and lost material on the bit. An auxiliary attachment, I assume you could cut that auxiliary attachment in half and, and shim one side, of course, but um, this makes it much easier. You just turn these dials in increments. Don't go yet, there's still more. For clarity, I wanna share with you the optional accessories that I use for my Shopsmith that I find invaluable. You may see these show up in my videos from time to time, and I just wanna make clear that these are additional purchases. The casters are an optional accessory I couldn't live without. The value of the Shopsmith Mark V and Mark VII systems for me is really flexibility. The ability to roll it away when I need to pull the cars in the garage. Without these casters, I can't access that value. Another optional accessory that is really convenient is this 10 position magnetic quill. I really like this. I have the extra hub on the other side as well, which means I can switch the handle from side to side really quickly. I really like to have a second auxiliary table for the left side of the machine, particularly when storing the machine. It gives me more stable surface to store things on, and it's more support for cutting large sheet goods. Of course, I can use the table legs and the connector tubes to set up a floating table in this manner, but at this point I can't move the machine around without moving these legs. It's very simple to add that second auxiliary table, and now I have the extra support and storage area, and the machine is still portable. 
I purchased this extra table off of eBay for my 510 system. Now I have to make a decision as to how I'm going to upgrade this for my Mark 7. Let's start with sanding accessories. These drum sanders are from Harbor Freight. They do include two half inch drives, which mount perfectly in the half inch router arbor. This is the conical disc sander. It's not just used for the jointer and thickness planer knife sharpening jig. Um, it can be used to edge sand wood, which is very helpful for plywood. It's also handy to have some extra 12 inch discs so that you can keep different grits on them and uh, label the backs. Extra safety gear is always helpful. I like having any type of extra feather board I can, especially like this Shopsmith vertical fence mounted feather board that comes with these sliding T-nuts. While we're talking about T-nuts, I like having some extras around. It's helpful for jigs and fixtures. And while we're talking about safety, I like having the standalone riving knife for when the full driving knife with upper guard is just in the way and you can't use it. I also like having these micro jig gripper push blocks. Of course, these don't come standard with a Shopsmith Mark 7, obviously, but uh, when I'm using these, it's real handy to have this riving knife because a lot of times when I'm using these, I'm straddling the blade, so that means I can't use the upper guard. Here are a couple items for accurate setups. This is the miter set. It's the Shopsmith version that fits the Shopsmith miter bar. With this thing, I can get accurate setups on the miter gauge every time, no frustration. It's quick and I really like having it. This collar that can either go on the auxiliary table post or the main table post allows me to micro adjust and fine tune in certain cuts or router cuts or things like that. I also like having the scale on there. I find that's pretty helpful. And these are extra collars. They're the split collar kind. What's great about these is I don't have to take the table off to add them on. I just unscrew the bolts, open up the collar all the way, and assemble it with the table on the machine. Then that way I can register certain settings and come back to them later. I frequently use the Molder Dado Blade Arbor. It's an optional accessory that is very handy, as is the 5 8 inch arbor. Standard with the Shopsmith is an inch and a quarter arbor. The 5 8 inch arbor allows me to mount standard 5 8 inch 10 inch table saw blades to the Shopsmith. Now the Shopsmith blades are excellent, but in a pinch, if I chip a tooth on something and I'm in the middle of the project, I can run to the store and buy a standard blade to keep the project going and mount it on this arbor. Standard with the Shopsmith is a cup center that is a dead center, meaning it doesn't spin on a bearing. Uh, this is a lithe center for the lathe and it uh, spins on a bearing. That is way more enjoyable to use than the dead center. I'm not going to cover any special purpose tools, but I will talk about this biscuit joiner. I've really enjoyed using this. I think there's a place for dowels, there's a place for mortises, and there's a place for biscuits. And having this, especially for aligning glue ups, I just really enjoy it. And man, the dust collection on this thing is awesome. Extra light is always handy. I have two versions of the Shopsmith utility light. One that mounts with this bracket onto any of the tools. For example, I could screw this to the back of the headstock and one that is really the same, except it also comes with this extra bracket for mounting in any of the slots on the fences or in the miter slot. Wow, this has been a long one. I wanna thank every single one of you who stuck with me to this point. That does it for this one and I'll see you in the next Woodshop Nerdery video.